and welcome everyone to be the seminar room. And also, I have to say hello to those on the website, uh, on, the, on Google Meet meeting room. Uh, our camera is over there. <laughs> so I'm waving to you, although I cannot see you. OK, uh, today we are glad to have our third talk in this seminar series. Uh, we are kindly to invite uh, Dr. Kai Wei Zhang, uh, Dr. Zhang uh, from Texas A&M uh, at this moment for his uh, postdoctoral research at, uh, at this moment. Uh, some background about Dr. Zhang. Actually, he is the same with you a few years ago. In 2011 to 2013, uh, he was the master student for remote sensing program and sitting here. And after 2013, he, I think, yeah, after, yeah, he, he served in military for one year. He served in military for one year. That's compulsory in Taiwan. And then after returning from military service, he fly to United States to continue his PhD study and then received, uh, you see, several awards, <laughs> several awards and all presenting uh, several talks in international conference. As of today, uh, he published already five papers and received his PhD to relocate to Texas A&M uh, to continue his PhD, uh, postdoc research at this moment. So he's quite kind of role model if you would like to talk to your academic career in the future. So that's, the, that's one of the example uh, we, we starting from here. And his bachelor's degree also in NCU, in NCU, Department of Atmosphere Science. All right, today he will kind of share uh, his recent study uh, about the convective influence on the North American monsoon anticyclone. Uh, as you can see, that's in your slide at this already. And uh, he already pre-recorded a video clip. So we listen to the video clip. Uh, then some, he already online at this moment. He already online at this moment. So he will join us. As, and then if you have questions, and you can ask uh, afterward. Hi, everyone. My name is Zhang Kai Wei. Currently, I'm a postdoc at Texas A&M University. And I'm very happy to have the chance to give a talk for the PRISM seminar. Today, I will be talking about the convective influence on the North American monsoon anticyclone. For the first half of the talk today, I will give some background about these anticyclones. I will show some climatology and then describe what is the relationship between convection and anticyclones and also uh, the origins of these anticyclones. In the second half, I will present some results from our study. This is the title here. And what we try to do is use reanalysis and some uh, satellite observations to show the connection between the anticyclone and convection associated with the North American monsoon. Here we're looking at the mean July stream function at 370K potential temperature. So this is usually above the tropopause. In the Eastern Hemisphere, you can see these enclosed contours of stream function indicating uh, anticyclones. And in the Eastern Hemisphere, it is very apparent, very strong. In the Western Hemisphere, there is also an anticyclone over North America, although it's much smaller. And we also know that uh, during summertime, the Asian monsoon produces a lot of precipitation, as you can see in South Asia, Southeast Asia over here. And there is also a monsoon in the Western Hemisphere called the North American monsoon or the Mexican monsoon. And during uh, June, July, August, there is a lot of convection and precipitation in this area over uh, the West Coast of Mexico. So later on, I will show that uh, these anticyclones are connected to convection inside these areas. These plots show the mean water vapor at 100 hectopascal. So this is typically near or above the tropopause. And uh, 
The colors show the mean water vapor retrieved by the uh, RA microwave lens sounder. So this is a mic uh, microwave instrument on board the RA satellite. And especially during June, July, and August, you can see that uh, in these regions associated with the anticyclones in the UTLS, in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere, there are elevated amounts, high amounts of water vapor. So you can see that the anticyclones tend to uh, contain air that is being moistened by uh, overshooting convection. So overshooting convection is a deep convection that reaches uh, at or above the tropopause and have an overshooting top like this. And this envoy is probably where the tropopause level is. And in this picture, you can also see cirrus plumes which indicate that there's probably some water vapor being injected above the tropopause into the stratosphere. So this is most likely the reason that we see the uh, high amounts of water vapor in these regions. Here is another look at water vapor, the connection between water vapor and the anticyclone. Here I am showing at the mean stream function of July and August at 380K potential temperature. So this is the lower stratosphere and the color is the uh, water vapor mixing ratio from the microwave limb sounder. So based on these plots, it's quite apparent that uh, in these regions associated with these uh, lower stratospheric anticyclones, there are high amounts of water vapor. So this shows you uh, <coughs> the circulation of the anticyclone tends to prevent mixing so that moisture is accumulating inside these anticyclones and then over time it's also being spread out into the global stratosphere. Aside from influencing water vapor, you can also see signatures of high aerosol amount. This plot shows the mean June, July, August aerosol extinction retrieved by the uh, SAGE-2. This is also a satellite instrument. And this is the aerosol extinction coefficient at 16 kilometers. So this is also in the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, UTLS heights. So in the locations of the anticyclones, the North American monster anticyclone, the Asian monster anticyclone, it's obvious there is some elevated amounts of aerosol. So this is most likely uh, deep convection bringing up uh, polluted air or air rich with the boundary layer aerosol into the UTLS. And because of the circulation from the anticyclones, the air is being trapped inside. So why are there these uh, anticyclones in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere? The reason is because of large-scale dynamics. Here we are looking at a diagram of the circulation associated with the Asian monsoon. So we know that in South Asia, Southeast Asia, there is a lot of convection, a lot of precipitation. And in the upper troposphere, there is the anticyclone, like we saw in the previous plots. And in the lower troposphere, there is a cyclone. So associated with monsoon system, there is this anticyclone cyclone pair. And the reason is because the atmosphere is responding to the, the latent heating from convection. Now the right here shows a study from Gill 1980. So they did a theoretical study and they showed that uh, if you put a heating source, for example, here, you know, then the atmospheric response in the lower troposphere is shown in these wind fields and also this is the pressure anomaly so in the lower troposphere there is a cyclone formed northwest of the heating location so this cyclone is basically what you observe here and then in the upper troposphere the solution is the opposite sign so instead of a high pressure anomaly you have a uh, in instead of a low pressure anomaly you have a high pressure anomaly causing the anticyclone so this is a theory behind uh, how these monsoonal precipitation is forming the uh, cyclone and anticyclone pair. 
And then another thing to note here is that uh, even though this diagram shows the convection is right uh, in the center of the, the cyclone or NS cyclone, that's actually not, uh, this is not quite correct. As you can see in the theory here, this is the heating and then this is the response of the cyclone or anticyclone. And in the observation, you can also see this where in this region, this is where the Asia monsoon has a lot of convection and precipitation. And the north of this region of latent heating, the anticyclone is formed here towards the north. And similarly, in the Western Hemisphere, this is the region of higher uh, frequency of precipitation and convection. And the anticyclone is formed northwest of the heating zones. The connection between a latent heating from convection and the anticyclone has also been shown in a simulation. So these are some results based on the uh, general circulation model in a study done by Sue and Bowman. What they did was they took a GCM and then uh, put a thermal forcing based on trim precipitation. So the red values here show the latent heating they estimated from trim precipitation. Trim is a uh, satellite with a radar. And using the forcing derived from the satellites, they were able to show that the atmospheric response in the uh, 150, 150 hectopascal of geopotential height shows the anticyclone associated with the Asian monsoon and also with the North American monsoon. And furthermore, if they only force one hemisphere, so for example, in this plot here, they only force the Eastern hemisphere. So showing the, they only used heating from the Asian monsoon precipitation. Then you can see that you only observe the Asian monsoon anticyclone, but not the North American anticyclone. And similarly, if you have no forcing in the Eastern hemisphere and only put forcing associated with the North American monsoon, the heating over here, then you can form just the North American monsoon anticyclone. So this clearly, you, from this, you can clearly see the relationship between monsoonal convection and the anticyclones in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. So a quick summary of the background. Uh, UTLS or the upper troposphere and lower stratospheric anticyclones are important because they affect trace gas like water vapor and they also affect the aerosol distributions and how they are transported in the large scale. And we were able to see that convection is a source of the forcing for the anticyclone. And this is demonstrated both in theory as well as in modeling. And uh, when we looked at the water vapor and aerosol in the upper troposphere, we can see that the anticyclones is influencing the large scale distribution of these gases. So these anticyclones are important. So far, the Asian monsoon anticyclone is pretty frequently studied, but the North American monsoon anticyclone or the NAMA is not well understood. So currently, uh, <clears throat> the connection between convection and the strength of the NAMA has mostly been established only in simulations. So we would like to try and use observations and also reanalysis to demonstrate the connection between convection and anticyclone in the upper troposphere. This study is currently in, re in revision in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. The left plot here is a closer look at the anticyclone. Here I plotted the 150 hectopascal geopotential height. So clearly you can see the anticyclone here and the color values are the precipitation rate from iMERGE, which is a satellite data set based on GPM, the Global Precipitation Mission. Over northwestern Mexico, which is here, the precipitation is pretty high and steady. 
during July and August, as you can see here. So this may serve as a as a quasi steady heating source for the anticyclone, and we would like to try and show the connection between convection inside this domain and the circulation over North America. The data set we're using here is the ERA-5 reanalysis. We're taking the geopotential height as well as temperature. For convective strength, we are using the alkyl long wave radiation. And this is because when there is deep convection, the cloud tops tend to be high and cold. So the upwelling long wave radiation is weak. Therefore, low OLR values correspond to a strong convection. The method in our paper is very simple. We correlate the average OLR inside this red box to geopotential height at each era 5 grid box. And also we do the same thing for temperature. We use pentad time series for the correlation. Pentad time series are time series where each data point represents a five day average. And for the time series of geopotential, the center dates are shown here. So we are taking the dates from mid-June to mid-September from each year. So there are about 20, maybe 22 pentads here. And then we piece together the pentads from every single year, from 1979 to 2019, to form a long time series. We also do this for OLR, except the pentad dates are shifted by n days so that when we correlate OLR to geopotential, we can get a lag correlation. Here I am showing the correlation coefficients between uh, the negative of OLR and geopotential at 150 millibars. So I'm taking the negative of OLR because when there is strong convection, there tends to be low OLR values. So negative OLR is proportional to convective strength. So here the black contours are correlation coefficients and the colored are the uh, slope of the correlation and are only plotted where the statistical significance is at 99%. So here I'm showing three different lags, zero, three, and six. And at lag zero, you can see that the correlation is not very strong. So lag zero means that the OLR and the geopotential are coming from the same time. So the correlation is not strong here. However, as the lag increases, for example, at lag of six days, there is a strong, stronger correlation here northwest of the box, which corresponds to a positive uh, geopotential height anomaly. And this is indicating that after periods of strong convection, there tends to be this anticyclonic anomaly. And the lag of six days means that uh, OLR is before the geopotential. So if there's a period of strong convection, maybe around after six days, the atmosphere will, will respond and then you will tend to observe an anticyclonic anomaly here. So this is for uh, 150 millibars. And here I'm showing the similar correlation results except for uh, geopotential at 700 millibars. Here, instead of the, the positive height, we see here there is negative height anomalies indicating a cyclonic circulation. So we can see here there is the anticyclonic, the cyclonic pair that you would expect from theory. These are similar plots to the last slide, except this is the correlation between negative of OLR and temperature at 100 and 300 hectopascal. So instead, uh, in addition to influencing the geopotential height, strong convection also influences the temperature in the upper troposphere where at 100 hectopascal, there is this region of strong cold anomaly 
and at 300 hectopascal there is the region of warm anomaly. This is the vertical structure of the correlations at 25 north, which is right here indicated by the red line. The black contours are the correlation coefficients between OLR and geopotential. So these positive contours here are indicating the anticyclone signal. And the core of the anticyclonic anomaly is here at about 150 hectopascal. So throughout the uh, UTLS, upper triple sphere, lower stratosphere, you can observe this anticyclonic signal. And then in the lower troposphere, the negative values indicate the cyclonic uh, circulation. The color contours are the correlation coefficient for temperature. So here we can clearly see that above the anticyclone, there tends to be cold anomalies, and then below it, there is a warm anomaly. So there is a pretty strong vertical structure signal uh, correlated with convective strength inside this domain, red box domain. You can also see this type of vertical structure in the numerical experiment. Here I'm showing some results from Seal and Bowman 2019. So they used a, a GCM and then imposed a idealized heating as indicated by these contours right here. So this would mimic the latent heating from convection as if there were some precipitation here. And the response in the GCM is uh, shown in the black contours. You can see that there is this anticyclone here. And the cross section here is shown in the right plot. And very similar to what we showed before, the anticyclonic anomaly is strongest at about 150 hectopascal spreads throughout the upper troposphere and above the core of the anticyclone there are these cold temperature anomalies and below it are warm anomalies so the right here this is the model result and this is our result and they are quite similar so when we use the reanalysis and, and satellite olr data we can see the same type of signal that you would expect in a, a model simulation or theory so, so far we've been able to show that um, the anticyclone cyclone pair forms after periods of strong convection. However, there is something quite odd here. This is the position of the anticyclone, whereas this is where we are finding the anomaly. And clearly, they are in different positions. So the anomaly that we see is about here, which is westward of the climatological anticyclone and we wanted to try and show uh, why this is happening we composited the july august uh, mean geopotential height at 150 millibars by taking the 10 years with the highest olr or weakest convection so these are the 10 years of weak convection and the mean geopotential height is shown in the contours. Plot B is the 10 years with strongest convection or lowest OLR. And you can see that during the years of weak convection, this contour here, the 14225, is smaller than this one. So during the years of strong convection, the anticyclone is larger. And if we take the difference between these two plots, take B minus A, this is the result. And you can see the strongest anomaly is actually towards the west of the anticyclone, showing us that the anticyclone is larger and expands westward during summers of strong convection. And this explains why in our lag correlation, we see the anomaly to be west of the anticyclone, which is because during periods of strong convection, it influences the large scale circulation, and then the anticyclone expands westward. So you have this signal here. To summarize, 
using observations and error 5 reanalysis, we're able to show that uh, the UTLS cyclone and UTLS anticyclone and low, lower tropospheric cyclones form after strong convection, which is consistent with the theory and also modeling. And then during periods of strong convection, the anticyclone tends to become wider and span further westward. So these are the main results from our paper. There are uh, many future paths of research. So for example, the variability and dynamics of these anticyclones are still not well understood. And also the question of how much water vapor is injected into the anticyclone by overshooting convection that's also hard to quantify. Finally, of course, there's also climate change. There's a lot of uncertainty on how anticyclones will change in the future, as well as uh, how overshooting convection may change. So uh, that's all I have today. I'll be happy to take any questions right now, or you can also reach me at uh, these two emails. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, very yeah, nice. Very nice. Uh, at least I understand what the differences between that. I know something about the North America uh, anti-cyclone. Uh, due to the monsoon. Okay, question from audience or even online. Okay, this is using the remote sensing data to confirm the model, result, model results. And using uh, OLR, which means uh, outgoing long wave radiation, outgoing outgoing long wave radiation. The Earth will emit the long wave radiation toward to the space. If the colder surface will less uh, outgoing long wave radiation due to its cold object. If that's warm, then that means uh, less cloud, and that will have more outgoing long wave radiation so that we can know where is uh, the kind of cold object due to clouds, such like clouds. So that's why uh, uh, Dr. Zhang using OLR to diagnostic uh, location and uh, alter, uh, even uh, altitude for the, for the uh, uh, anti-cyclone in UTLS, upper traffic, upper tropospheric, uh, lower stratosphere. Then if no, then I got Few, I got few <laughs> question to Kai Wei. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I see the observation uh, kind of in the the highest correlation is about in the west of one hundred fifty. The model shows nine hundred uh, about nine hundred west, and you explain that's due to the expansion of the anti cyclone, and the second is uh. I see the correlation in the stratosphere and the troposphere. Actually, it's in the tilt. It's tilt. Uh, but the model shows it's uh, aligned with it vertically. Uh, any explanation for this tilt? I think it's slide 20 and 21. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Liu, he is referring to um, this tilt right here. Yeah, so this is the observation, and there's this tilt, whereas in the model, there is no tilt. And yeah, we actually don't, don't have an explanation for this. So in the paper, we mentioned that uh, there is this tilt, but um, yeah, we don't actually have an explanation for this. That is a good question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm just curious about why it's tilt. Okay, uh, the next will become, uh, is it, a uh, big differences between uh, Nama, I think pronounced Nama. Is there any diff big differences between Nama and uh, Asian monsoon anticyclone? So uh, the Asian monsoon anticyclone is this one. They also covers the Taiwan region. Taiwan is right here. So the Asian monsoon anticyclone is much stronger, much larger, and it's there pretty much all the time. Whereas the, the Nama, it can disappear. So if you look at um, if you look at uh, one day uh, winds, then maybe you won't see the NAMA, but you will always see the um, Asian monsoon anticyclone. So I, I guess that is why more people study this. I, I, I think that's the main difference. 
Ah, I see. Okay, <laughs> interesting. So it will disappear in some season. So it's more obvious in summertime, is it? Yeah, it is uh, only in summertime. The question for mm -hmm. me is uh, toward to better understanding the UTLS. Uh, if we would like to know better about that, uh, any key parameters should be conducted for the for the study in the future. Do you have any suggestion? Yeah. So if I could choose, I would hope that missions like Cosmic and Cosmic 2 can continue. Yeah. So actually, the UTLS community uh, thinks very highly of the temperature uh, estimates from the RO. So it's very accurate and high quality. So I think that those are key uh, observations. And also, if uh, there are remote sensing instruments that can measure water vapor, you know, like, like the RMLS, I think that would be uh, also important. And then precipitation, like trim or GPM type of measurements. OK, I understand. So that means uh, detailed temperature profile uh, in vertical resolution, such like from cosmic radio yeah. occultation. Uh, so for MOSF, for MOSF at seven, uh, that continues to provide a global observation in high, very high altitude. And water vapor probably not that good from uh, radio occultation, but the water vapor coming from other instruments such as NASA and NOAA, even ESA, METAP series can be obtained. Uh, precipitation mission already launched uh, by GPN for 10 years already, uh, I think 2016, yeah, a few years already. So that can continuation for the, for the twin study. Uh, okay. Is, because some studies uh, try to link the study for the so-called lower atmosphere and upper atmosphere, now it's quite, <laughs> quite popular at this moment because uh, uh, that's due to the deep convection. Uh, something happening in troposphere will affect the stratosphere. So the coupling between these two, also a popular topic in Taiwan. I think Institute of, no, not, not Institute of Space Science. Now it's Department of Space and Engineering. <laughs> now we got a new, dep new department. Uh, it, just aside from Department of Atmosphere Science. So that was probably possible futures for study in a, in a... Can we obtain this method in another area or another season? season? So your question is, can, you, can we obtain this with another IR or with another season? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I th yeah, with other IR, I think so. So if you have IR from geostationary, that is... Uh, very similar to the outgoing long wave radiation. So I think any, any IR can work for this type of study. And then for different season, uh, I think the largest anti-cyclones are for uh, the summer because there's a lot of rain during Asian monsoon and the North American monsoon. So for the winter time, then maybe we have to look at Australia monsoon, which because in their hemisphere is summertime. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, some background information about the OLR, uh, that probably due to so-called clouds. So geostationary satellite may observe the so-called window channel and to can detect the cloud and the cloud can invert to so-called OLR. OLR. And that quietly affects that kind of things because high cloud will have less OLR, but low cloud or no cloud that will become high OLR. So infrared observation will come coming from geostationary satellites. That's kind of background information. Yeah, the long wave is is same thing as IR. Hello, Dr. Zhang. I have I have a question about the six six phase lag between the OLR and the, the geopotential height. How how to explain explain this phenomena? Thank you. Oh, okay. 
His question is how to explain the phenomena between uh, the connection of OLR and geopotential height. Yeah, so basically it is, it comes from the theory where if you have heating, then the atmosphere will change the wind and will respond to the heating. So when you have low OLR, there are clouds like deep convection and inside the convection, because rain is forming, so heating will form. And then that heating causes the atmospheric circulation to change. So that because the, the geopotential, the geopotential reflects the direction of the wind. So that is why the OLR is connected to the uh, geopotential. Okay, but why six days? Oh, six days. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so the exp so the week it's the correlation is weaker at a week uh, smaller days because the atmosphere doesn't have enough time to respond. Yeah, so, but as for why it's maximum at six days, I think that is just the uh, the time scale of the the response. Yeah. So I, I think it's consistent with some previous studies. Yeah. But as for why it's six days, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> okay, thank you. But because I think the response of the atmosphere is maybe quicker than a week, I, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the knowledge about this. So I asked this question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think because this uh, is pretty large scale. So I feel like it is reasonable that it takes a few days for the response to form. And then it's also, we also show that it's consistent with some previous studies. So I think it is uh, reasonable. Okay, thank you. All right, so I will say uh, no more one, but uh, Dr. Zhang provided his uh, email address on the last slide. Uh, so if you have any further comments, questions, uh, it can directly relate to the talk today. Or if you would like to know about something, uh, future planning, such like if you want to pursue your higher degree in the future, I think also can contact Dr. Zhang for his experience. Uh, actually, some professor here also can have willing to do it this way. But I think he will be the most uh, recent uh, PhD to get, uh, award, get awarded. So I think you can also consult his, his study experience. So not only academic way. Uh, so today I'm very happy to have you with us. And then uh, that's all for this seminar series. We still have another two next week. So stay tuned. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you.